Okay, so good morning and um, first of all, thank you very much for coming here today. It's a real pleasure to present some of my research to you and it's um, really great that you're all here taking an interest in the research that we're doing here at Garvin. So I study autoimmune diseases and this is essentially where you have immune cells in the body that go rogue and start attacking healthy parts of the body. So this is why my talk's called Targeting Rogue Clones. Um, but before I get into my research, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself and how I um, came to studying these rogue clones here at Garvin. So I started out in Adelaide. Um, I went to Flinders University, um, which is this building up on the hill there and then just below is this big public hospital and it's a teaching hospital and this is really where I learned about autoimmune disease. Um, I did my PhD in a lab that was directly next door to the diagnostic lab where they were getting all blood samples and diagnosing people with autoimmune disease. So this is really where I learned from some of the um, great clinicians and scientists about autoimmune disease. From there I did, um, after I finished my PhD, I spent three years working in New York. Um, I went to New York University um, and again working in a hospital environment on the East River there, Tisch Hospital, um, which is part of the New York University School of Medicine. And um, I worked here for about three years, still on autoimmune disease. Um, here I focused more on neonatal lupus, which is an autoimmune syndrome that affects um, young neonates or children at birth. And then from there, um, I came back to Australia and I moved to Canberra, where I started working with um, our now Deputy um, Director, Chris Goodnow, um, in the John Curtin School of Medicine. And um, here I was really interested in learning a bit more about genetic technologies. And I really wanted to apply some more genetic technologies to this problem of autoimmune disease. And so about three years ago, I moved to Garvin. Um, I came here because I was really impressed with the investment that Garvin were putting into genetic technologies. And I thought this is a real, real opportunity to make a difference in autoimmune disease. So an introduction to the immune system. So I like to think of the immune system as your own personal army. And really what it's there to do is exactly what this picture is. Um, depicting, it's to stop these, these germs, these pathogens from getting in and colonising and invading the body. So our immune system protects us from these pathogens, viruses, bacteria, all sorts of things. It also protects us from toxins and things that we might encounter, chemicals in the environment. And um, recently immunotherapies have really come to the floor with um, being able to use the immune system to fight cancer cells. So the immune system is composed of two major um, defence mechanisms. The first is really a physical barrier. So sh shown here is the fortress walls. But this is our skin, membranes around our organs, things like that, really to stop the bacteria getting in. And then our second line of defence is our cellular immunity. So these are the white blood cells um, that circulate, get into our organs, tissues, and just make sure that there's no, no um, bacteria or viruses or anything harmful. And this is really what we study at Garvin, cellular immunity. And so this cartoon here depicts um, a few different things going on. So we've got cells that are sort of direct, directly kill bacteria, um, shown with the swords. Um, they will kill viruses on contact. And then we've got cells um, in the bottom left corner there um, that are making things and they're secreting them into the blood. We call these antibodies. They're sort of like arrows that the cells make secrete to kill this bacteria. But occasionally things do go wrong. And so we study a lot of diseases of the immune system. So if your immune defences aren't strong enough, um, this is called immunodeficiency and people can be prone to infections throughout life. This is um, a big area of study here at Garvin. There's also, not only does your immune system need to be strong, but it needs to be specific. So it needs to actually target things that are harmful. And for those of you who suffer from hay fever or allergies would understand 
how annoying it can be when your immune system is targeting things that it doesn't really need to target. So this is things like allergy, um, peanuts, food, all sorts of things that um, the immune system can mount an improper response to. And then there's the area that I work on, which is autoimmunity. So this is where the immune system really needs to be able to distinguish between what's a bacterial cell and what's our own cells. And when the immune system gets confused and can't distinguish between what's self and what's foreign, we get what we call these road clones. So these road clones that I've shown here start making things to attack healthy parts of the body rather than attacking um, viruses. So autoimmune disease is a real problem in our community. It's, there's over 100 different diseases and these affect more than 10% of our population. They also seem to be on the increase. So I've depicted here a few different autoimmune diseases that we study here at Garvin. And while you can see they affect different organs, different parts of the body, we think the same underlying problem is in all of these diseases. And that is the group of immune cells that have gone rogue and have started attacking healthy parts of the body. So in rheumatoid arthritis, you might have rogue cells attacking the joints. Um, lupus nephritis, you have rogue cells attacking the kidneys. And the problem with autoimmune diseases and why it's such a challenge is that they're incurable. So at the moment, these chronic diseases that often affect people in early adulthood or as young as neonates, um, they require treatment for the rest of their life. And the treatments are really quite um, inadequate. So they tend to just dampen the whole immune system. They lack that specificity of being able to get the rogue clones. So the problem with that is that these people get a lot of side effects from taking these drugs long term, but also um, they're prone to getting infections because their immune system has been weakened by all these drugs. And then when these drugs eventually, if they fail or they don't work, then we really have to go about replacing what the rogue cells have damaged. So in type 1 diabetes, the rogue cells will attack the pancreas, which makes insulin. And so we replace the insulin. And then, in, like I mentioned before, lupus nephritis, where the rogue cells have attacked the kidneys, we end up having to, once immunosuppression has failed, we have to either do a transplant or dialysis. So really treatments at the moment are at a point of being crisis management and it's just, it's um, not really acceptable. So the purpose of my research is really to study these cells that have gone rogue, try to find them and identify an Achilles heel or what a weakness about these rogue cells that we can use to eliminate the rogue cells, preserve the rest of the immune system and hopefully um, lead to a cure for these diseases. So one of my major questions is why have these cells gone rogue? Why have they started to turn on, on the host, on the healthy person? So we've got a hypothesis that we're testing at the moment, which is that these rogue cells have acquired these mutations similar to what a cancer cell can get um, when it's dividing. So in a healthy scenario, I've depicted here these um, all these different immune cells on the left. And let's say that this, this blue cell with the red writing on it is a cell that recognises an organ or a, kid, a, a cell in your kidney, a healthy part of your body. In a normal healthy immune system, there'll be checkpoints in place that will remove this self-reactive B cell or immune cell and eliminate it and stop it from developing. But in people with autoimmune disease, these cells keep developing. And so we think it's because they've acquired these mutations which allow them to move through development and pass these particular checkpoints and get, end up in autoimmunity. So where are the rogue cells? Well, in people with active disease, we're finding that they're circulating through the blood. They're probably also in the organs that are getting damaged, um, but we have been able to detect them in the blood. So this is a normal 
blood sample shown here. And I've just shown you some of the different cells that are in your blood. So we've got red blood cells and platelets, and then the immune cells that I was talking about before, the monocytes, neutrophils and lymphocytes. These different cells are all circulating the body looking for infected cells. So where are the rogues in this situation and how do we find them? Well, our solution um, here at Garvin is to do single cell sequencing. So what this actually means is rather than analysing this group of cells as one big population, we actually get to look at every individual cell one at a time. So basically people with autoimmune disease, part of their disease is diagnosed by the presence of these self-reacting antibodies. And we can actually take these out of the blood. And so what we've been able to do with this new technology is actually sequence the antibody itself. And this gives us a really unique code. And that code is then used to compare to the cells. So we take cells from the patient's blood and then we put one cell per well, those little circles there, is a, it's a plate which is filled with 96 wells. And we put one cell at a time in each well. And then we sequence those and compare it with the autoantibody sequence. So the cells that are carrying that unique code are the rogue clones. They're making that antibody, they're causing the disease. So this is our analysis from the first patient we looked at. She has Sjogren's syndrome. The slide's gone a little funny there, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so we had some samples from this patient that we had stored in the freezer. So once we got this technology working, we were actually able to pull out samples from 2011 and look at the progression of this patient's disease. And what we found was that the rogue clone actually increased over time as her disease became worse. And so we thought this is a great way to be able to track disease and monitor it in the patients by looking at their rogue clones. But the other thing that was particularly inspiring for me was we were able to detect the rogue clone back in 2011 before the patient's disease actually got severe, before she actually had permanent organ damage. So that I saw as a window of opportunity. If we could have treated her in 2011, um, we may be able to prevent organ damage and prevent her disease from becoming worse. So this second patient um, that came into the clinic in 2016, also with Sjogren's syndrome and very severe um, vasculitis rash, um, was treated with an immunosuppressive drug, but responded very well to the therapy. And um, with the response to her therapy, we saw that these rogue clones re were reduced. So we think as well that these rogue clones may be a great measure of disease activity and a direct measure, rather than sitting around waiting to see if the patient gets better, we can actually see if the rogue clones are gone to determine if the therapy's working. So how can we use the information from these rogue clones to actually improve therapies, to get away from these non-specific immune suppressing drugs and actually get better tailored therapies for people. So this is, um, this is the gene expression profile. What you're looking at here is a gene map of our rogue cells. So on the column shown um, here, this is a long list of genes. And each little box is representing a single cell and its gene expression. So if the gene is turned on, it's this yellow colour, and if the gene's turned off, it's blue. So this is quite a complicated gene map, I realise. It's um, quite a few rogue cells, and we're comparing them to infection-fighting cells in the same patient. And really, the take-home message of all of this is that these rogue cells have more genes turned on, so they're actually quite activated. But from this, we studied this gene list very closely and we found this gene here called CD86. And that was particularly interesting for us because a lot of, is already known about CD86. We know that it activates immune cells and we think this is a way that this rogue clone is staying active and causing disease. 
But the great news is there's a new drug available that targets CD86. And while it's shown quite um, good usefulness in rheumatoid arthritis, it hasn't actually been used in Sjogren's syndrome before. So what we're doing is giving this data to this lady's clinician with hope that we're providing a scientific rationale for the use of this drug in this patient based on the expression on her rogue cells. So we think this is a more specific way um, if we can give this patient this drug which targets this gene, it will specifically remove the rogue clones while preserving all the infectious, the infection fighting cells which don't express the CD86. So the last little um, bit of information I'll show you here is um, some sequencing data. So this is looking at the DNA in these cells. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're looking for mutations in the rogue clones that we think may allow them to progress. Um, and what we actually found in this rogue clone, in this patient with Sjogren's syndrome, was a mutation which has been reported in multiple cases of cancer before. So it's been reported in multiple cases of lymphomas and leukemias and various blood cancers. And so we think this could be the underlying cause of this patient's disease. Um, and so our next step really is to ask the question, is this an underlying cause of other autoimmune diseases? Is it really that these cells are becoming like a cancer cell, acquiring these mutations, which allows them to progress? So now we're moving um, on to studying 36 autoimmune diseases with a new initiative um, called the HOPE Research Project. And basically we're going to take this same approach of single cell sequencing these rogue clones in multiple um, autoimmune diseases. And really the goal of this is to determine whether these autoimmune diseases really do have the same underlying cause. But along the way, I think studying these rogue clones and really understanding them, finding out how they're surviving, how they're proliferating, will actually allow us to identify new and more targeted therapies it's quite likely that not every single patient's rogue clone is going to express CD86 and work for that particular drug. We know that from clinical trials. They don't work in every patient. But that's why I think a personalised medical response here is really important. And we need to actually look at every patient and try to work out which groups are going to work best for which therapies. So that's um, where that's going at the moment. And um, definitely if we can link between autoimmune disease and cancer, we may also be able to use some of the immunotherapies that are such a success in cancer at the moment. So really, um, I'm very hopeful about the HOPE Research Project and it's really, um, it's building my vision, which is, I think it's going to be, we're going to get towards a world where autoimmune disease is not a chronic disease and it's not forever. I think if we can eliminate these rogue clones, we will see an end to arthritis, lupus, um, and other autoimmune diseases. So I'd like to finish by just introducing you to the HOPE research team. This is um, our group here, we're really um, enthusiastic and dedicated group of clinicians and scientists that work together and really share that vision of a world where autoimmune disease is not forever. Um, and finally, I'd just like to thank you all for your attention and for your support um, with all these projects that we do here. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Well, a lot of the drugs are approved for some diseases already. So um, part of this, I think, will be able to 
better use some of these new, more specific biologic drugs that are already available and already out there. Um, the problem with those biologic drugs is they're just, they're very expensive and they only work in some patients. And at the moment, clinicians have no way of knowing who the drug's going to work in and who it's not going to work in. So I think this is um, an approach that will be relatively short term, I think. Um, in terms of um, grouping diseases and um, maybe designing new therapies based on that gene profile, that's probably several years down the track. Is there a limited time that the drugs will work on these rodents or can it go on? Well, because we're not, yeah, we're not sure whether the rogue clones will keep coming back or not. Um, so the hope, I mean, we can keep following these patients to, to see how long it'll take. Um, it'll probably be similar to um, a cancer where someone might be in remission where we, we can't detect them anymore and they might go for years. Um, but at the moment, we just don't know whether they will come back, whether there's I mean, if it is just a, a spontaneous event and it's a random mutation, if we get rid of it, the chances of that random mutation happening again are quite low. So we're hopeful we can get rid of it. There was a small paragraph in the paper this week that there was a real breakthrough with the rheumatoid arthritis, but it didn't say a lot. It was just a very tiny paragraph. Is this, like you say, just one of these small random breakthroughs? Yeah, so um, rheumatoid arthritis has had quite a few new drugs coming um, out and getting approval. And um, because rheumatoid arthritis is the most common autoimmune disease, it tends to be um, the one that sees the new drugs sooner because there's more people affected so they can enrol more people in trials and um, test whether the drugs work. Um, so there's been quite a few new drugs approved for rheumatoid arthritis, but again, we're finding there seems to be subsets of people that they work really well for and then other people that don't respond at all. So, it's, yeah. So the arthritis you're talking about is rheumatoid arthritis, is it not osteo? Yeah, um, rheumatoid's more autoimmune mediated. Yep, that's what we're studying. Yep. These new drugs aren't treating the genes, they're just treating the symptoms, is that correct? The new biologic drugs? Yeah. Um, so they're, they're actually targeting um, particular molecules on the cells that are causing the symptoms. Um, but I guess the problem at the moment is the clinicians, the clinical immunologists tend to have to wait for the symptoms to develop before they're allowed to administer certain drugs. Um, so what we're hoping with our approach is that we can detect the clones early and say this is a predictor that this disease is going to get very severe and treat early before there's permanent organ damage. Thank you. Um, yep. Oh. <laughs> Got the collaborators there. Yep. They're at the bottom of the slide. There, there are like academic um, organisations. Could you perhaps just describe the, the pathway from taking the work of yourselves and the collaborators to the um, pharmaceutical and drug companies? Just the, sure. I, I don't really understand how it gets from inside your organisation out to the drug companies and then to the public. Because obviously, drug companies get involved at some point. Yeah, so I've already, um, based on our finding with CD86, I've already um, engaged with the drug company that make the CD86 um, targeting drug. Um, and they're currently doing a clinical trial. So I've been able to work with them and get all the samples from the people enrolled in their clinical trial. In terms of whether we um, find something new, um, how we get that to a clinic. So Garvin has um, a set up a partnerships group here um, who really um, protect our interests and our IP, but also look for um, partners 
that can um, help us get our drugs to the clinic or our ideas out there. So um, that's their sort of department where they engage with industry and pharmaceutical companies to try to find a good fit. I'm most interested in the crossover that you have drawn between uh, cancer research and autoimmune research. My question is, on a practical level, what can we do to keep our autoimmune system healthy and strong so that mm. it never, in a sense, is vulnerable in the first place? Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, this is a great question because um, we've, we've been, we've had many, many coffees and stuff in the lab trying to actually say, well, what does a healthy immune system look like? Because when you do look at other people's immune cells, you can take five different people's immune cells and they can have, they can all look very different. Um, but these people can all be really healthy. So it's really hard to, um, to try to pinpoint um, what a healthy immune system looks like to start with. Um, when, when we look at who gets autoimmune diseases, who's at higher risk, um, there's, there's definitely risk factors. There's genetic, environmental, lifestyle things um, that can predispose people to autoimmunity. But in terms of trying to avoid, it's um, a really a difficult area to it's such a complex disease and it's really hard to know who's, who's going to get it. Um, I guess, yeah, clean living and <laughs> good diet, exercise. <laughs> yeah. okay, we'll take one more question and oh. then we'll have to move on. Could uh, this uh, research also apply to what in times of like um, IBS and um, and food intolerances as well? Yeah, so there is a lot of interest in, in allergy and um, I, I think we should be able to um, find um, cells that specifically react with peanuts in the same way we can find cells that specifically react with kidney cells or self um, antigens as well. So. It could definitely, these techniques could definitely be used for allergy and um, those sorts of things, food intolerances. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.